two of the fundamental barriers for autonomy are 3D sensing and perception. How well these vehicles see and understand the world around them. They can only make safe decisions based on accurate real-time 3D data. Solving these challenges requires a lot more than capital and smart specialized engineers. It takes the audacity to build something entirely from the ground up, hardware as well as software, to make autonomy possible, bring it out of R&D, and actually put it into production. Together with Luminar, we have developed LiDAR technology with unprecedented perception capability. That means that you can detect not only that there is a human being here, but also where he or she is moving. LiDAR is an absolute requirement for a safe autonomous drive. It's a great challenge and a great reward to be able to develop autonomous technology for the future. This vehicle really represents the most sophisticated automated driving platform that TRI has built. You know that little thing looks like a siren on the top of the car going around in a circle? Does every LiDAR system have to have that? No, no definitely not. Ours, ours actually doesn't, doesn't spin. It doesn't spin. No, no. When you see Luminar on the roof of your car, you'll know that it's a vehicle that safely enables true autonomy. We've always known this is possible, and now we're the ones to have solved it. And that's why we continue on this pursuit every day, inspired to make autonomous transportation truly safe and ubiquitous. Thanks everyone for joining, certainly an exciting time. I'm Austin Russell, founder and CEO of Luminar, hosting today at one of our LiDAR software testing as well as vehicle integration facilities in Palo Alto, California. As for any company, entering the public markets is a landmark milestone that caps our incredible journey so far and brings us into a whole next chapter. With that, look, really look forward to the opportunity to be able to share more details about the company, technology, product, commercial integration, and strategy with myself and some of the key members of our leadership team. Our vision is to make autonomous transportation safe and ubiquitous. And at Luminar, we're all incredibly passionate and committed to be able to make that happen. The ultimate goal of this industry has always been around safety. And with that said, it's crazy to put even into perspective just that we do lose 1.3 million lives every year out on the road from, from vehicle-related collisions and deaths. And these are the things that can be preventable from technology. That's the opportunity to be able to prevent. We don't have to have fully autonomous technology everywhere all the time to be able to make that happen, but this will have just an incredibly massive impact on society. These are the things that we need to fulfill, and these are the things that we can do today. That's what we're here to solve. All right, let's go for some quick history and then we can dive a little bit deeper into the technology. So I founded the company about eight years ago with a goal to be able to build a new type of LiDAR sensing system for the autonomous vehicle space. And there's a number of very stringent requirements that are needed to build a system to be able to safely enable autonomy and be able to see it through into production in the real world. So knew there was no way to be able to do this and meet the performance and safety requirements, seeing out to 250 meters in the distance for all types of objects with great resolution, much less also in a very cost-effective device using off-the-shelf parts. And that's why we had to start from scratch, building our own components, our laser receiver, scanning mechanism, processing electronics, uh, to be able to have something that could meet this specification. So with that vision and architecture, uh, started to bring on a couple hundred highly specialized uh, team members and engineers to be able to build out the various components and systems in this architecture to be able to see this happen in the real world. Over the course of the first five years, we remained in stealth mode. We actually ended up acquiring a couple of companies along the way, uh, including uh, you know, Black Forest Engineering, uh, a chip design company based out of Colorado Springs, and uh, Open Photonics, uh, which actually brought on a co-founder, uh, Jason, into this that you'll uh, meet later. And with that, that's where we showed off to the world what was possible in 2017 with this breakthrough level performance. That was when we launched with four key commercial partners. And over the next couple of years, spent a little bit more time specifically on the commercialization, industrialization, and maturity side of things. Uh, expanding from four partners to now over 50 companies that we're working with today. And going through the various iterations of the technology, we're actually well into multiple generations of our own chip designs, of our own architectures, and all coming back to the same fundamental technology and principle, but continuing to iterate on it to a point of now we can put it into series production. Further driving customer growth and accelerating programs is a software stack that we've successfully developed on top of our LiDAR. If the LiDAR is the eyes of the autonomous car, this is the brain, and this allows it to be able to 
uh, autonomously understand what's going on around it in the environment and be able to safely navigate accordingly. This year, I'm uh, excited to be able to get out there with our Iris product for series production. The holy grail of the autonomous industry has always been to be able to take it out of R&D and put it into series production. We've been able to do exactly that with our landmark deal with Volvo to be able to put our LiDAR and software in the next generation of consumer vehicles in series production starting in 2022. The fundamental reason for why we're here comes down to the technology and what we've been able to build. We took a very different approach, whereas most companies in the autonomous vehicle space have started from the software side of it and worked their way to try to figure out what hardware can accommodate. And we knew that the hardware and the sensing systems out there were not nearly enough in terms of performance and safety to be able to ultimately solve this problem and enable autonomy to make its way into the real world. So we've been largely focused on the passenger vehicle side as well as the long haul trucking side of the equation here. Um, really leveraging this existing multi-trillion dollar a year industry to be able to see our technology become ubiquitous and be deployed in the near term. Specifically, we're largely focusing on highway autonomy use cases uh, for driver out of the loop functionality in those environments because they're more constrained than urban environments. That's one of the key areas that we see actually being able to be successfully enabled in the relative near term. We think there's a lot of promise over the long term for level four or five urban autonomy, uh, which is largely where the vast majority of the companies in this autonomous domain have focused. Um, but we see that operating in complex urban environments will still take a long time to successfully train systems to be able to handle all of those types of edge cases. If you take a look at the broader sets and levels of autonomy, you can really separate out things into two discrete areas, assisted driving and autonomous driving. Very different things. So assisted driving, the driver's in the loop constantly, paying attention, ready to take over the wheel at any given moment, eyes on the road. This is a reminiscent of the Tesla autopilot systems of this world and relevant other systems with other automakers that require constant driver attention and may follow a couple lanes on the road ahead. With autonomy, and by the time you go into that domain, driver no longer has to be constantly paying attention. You know, start using your phone, work on your laptop, watch a movie, you know, that, that kind of thing during that time and know that you can be safer than a human otherwise would have been. In addition to the highway autonomy focus that we have, we are also able to enable something that's often overlooked, which is what we call proactive safety. In the areas where we're not autonomous, you know, in suburban and urban environments, in addition to, of course, when you do manually drive on highways, if you decide to do so, then proactive safety will be able to help prevent forward collisions by actively taking control over the braking systems and steering wheel to be able to get you out of hairy situations altogether. It starts with the data, garbage in, garbage out. And when it comes to safety, it's not acceptable. So you have to have a level of reliability that's been unprecedented before. You have to be able to accurately detect all of these different types of so-called edge cases to be able to accurately and safely be able to drive. And I'd like to show a few examples of what we mean by these kinds of edge cases and what and how our LiDAR and our software solves exactly that problem. All right, so what you'll see here in these examples is raw 3D data coming from our LiDAR with different colors representing different distances as it goes out with perception, the detection of those objects layered on top of that represented by bounding boxes. This is actually during a data collection run on the 280 freeway at night. You'll be able to see, zooming way out in the distance, 250 meters ahead, a stalled black car out on the road. We get seven points on that object, which is really a lot in this context. And 250 meters really represents just seven and a half seconds ahead at those speeds. So it's important to be able to see that full distance. So in these kind of situations, you'd ultimately be able to come to a safe stop. If you zoom into 75 meters ahead, just a few seconds ahead, we could actually be able to clearly make out what's going on. You can see the person, the car, a tire on the road. It's a person actually, you know, swapping out their tire that was pulled under the shoulder. And even at 25 meters, you can clearly make out even by eye what those different objects are. It goes to show the kinds of things that we're able to now see with this per level of performance from a LiDAR standpoint, as well as our software for detecting and identifying the objects ahead. So in the next example, we'll show LiDAR safety and performance is important even in lower speeds too as well. If you take a look at this example, uh, we have one of our data collection cars driving around just after dusk. You can see some camera footage of this suburban neighborhood. And I don't know if you quite caught that, but there was a white orb 
that just rolled out into the screen, uh, just in the middle of the road there. And it's actually really hard to be able to detect, particularly with just the camera, with everything going on. You have the other street lights, you have some other lights in the scene. Um, but this is where LiDAR is supposed to come in and help save the day. The challenge is, even with these very expensive legacy LiDAR systems, if you zoom in on this data, you can actually only get a single point on that ball. And that's not nearly enough to be able to accurately detect something. It's usually an autonomous car would just see that as noise and be able to drive right through it. With Luminar, it's a completely different story. That exact same frame, we can clearly make out what's going on with the ball, and of course, what's to come, a girl chasing after it. That's what makes all the difference. You can see our software identify the different objects, and you can actually even see the scene play out live with a girl running out in the street and the car coming to a safe stop just in time. Those are the examples of edge cases that are absolutely needed to be able to successfully enable any level of autonomy to be able to clearly recognize and see and of course are still extremely helpful for assisted driving systems. For many, the question of how and when autonomy will successfully transition R&D and be put into the real world has been outstanding for some time. Just a few years ago, the predominant assumption was that urban ride-hailing robotaxis would be the de facto way autonomy is realized in the real world in a city near you by 2020. Of course, that didn't exactly happen, but it did at the time result in an explosion of companies focused on R&D in this domain. The rationale among these autonomous vehicle companies was, one, um, that sensing systems that cost tens of thousands of dollars, you know, ultimately needed to be amortized, you know, over the cost of the vehicle in 24-7 ride-hailing operation, hence the, you know, large roof racks of LiDAR systems and other things on these vehicles. Uh, two, there was no LiDAR that could ever meet the long-range, high-resolution performance requirements that are ultimately needed for high-speed highway autonomy driving, you know, as compared to the low-speed urban driving that required shorter range. And then number three is that autonomously navigating city environments would be a straightforward problem, was the assumption, uh, despite the massive complexity associated with edge cases in those urban environments. Today, none of these assumptions have proven true. The first two reasons, in large part, because of us. And now that we have a high-performance system that can see at long range and be a low enough cost to be able to put onto production consumer vehicles, it's something that was unfathomable just a handful of years ago. With that, we're the only autonomous vehicle company to be focusing in on this market, and at the same time, we're powering nearly every major autonomous trucking company out there. The economies of scale leveraging the passenger vehicle and trucking markets are also enabling this to be used for assisted driving use cases like the proactive safety system that we talked about to be able to prevent forward collisions and accidents ultimately altogether. And this is how we can see the technology standardized throughout the larger industry and make as big of a difference ushering in the whole next generation of vehicle technologies and safety systems. Launching this bold vision forward, we entered into a landmark deal with Volvo for the first automotive series production deal for autonomy in the industry. Our hardware and software is integrated into Volvo's next generation consumer vehicle platform to enable these highway autonomy and proactive safety features scheduled to start production in 2022. Historically, Volvo has been the industry leader when it comes to safety. And they've invented everything from you know, the three-point safety belt back in the day and introduced most modern new types of active safety technologies that have paved the way for next generation vehicle system safety. So with Luminar, expect it to be no different. We get to leverage the exact same product that we're building for the Volvo vehicles across the rest of the industry for other OEMs, for both passenger vehicles as well as trucks, in addition to the software too. That's really important to ultimately have a clear path towards widespread adoption in series production among multiple global automakers, and over the long term, standardization throughout the industry as with other safety technologies. Eight years ago, we completely reimagined LiDAR technology, building something entirely from the ground up. Since then, we've successfully delivered on it, and our LiDAR is the only one in existence that can meet the stringent performance, safety, and economic requirements to be able to see this through into series production, to take autonomy out of R&D and bring it into the real world. The seamless integration of our hardware and software together ultimately enables a turnkey autonomous solution that accelerates the ability for OEMs to deliver autonomy in series production scale. We're not just a major force in the LiDAR space, but also in the autonomous and auto industry at large. No other company has successfully built the LiDAR sensing foundation 
much less the software that's also required to be able to see this technology through into the broader industry, in series production, and that's what's made all the difference. As we've been making the transition from a technology development company to now global provider of autonomous systems to major OEMs, there's been a big shifting focus towards execution. And that's something where it's been driving a major focus of mine to be able to build out a really strong team of leadership of executors that can be able to see this vision through end to end. And that's what we built out here. Really look forward for you guys to have an opportunity to hear from some of those members. It all started with the technology. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to Jason in Orlando. Welcome to Luminar Orlando. I'm Jason Eichenholz, co-founder and chief technology officer. I'm responsible for the technology vision and strategy for Luminar. Here in Orlando, we're going to give you a peek under the hood to see the technology, architectures, and innovations that enable our products to deliver the industry-leading performance that you've seen and you'll see the rest of the day today. In Orlando, we have 250 of the 350 family members in the company, and you're going to get to see a little bit about the R&D and the core R&D architectures that enable our systems, the engineering and the capabilities to vertically integrate and de deliver an automotive-grade product, and the advanced manufacturing team that allows our systems to be deployed around the world. As Austin mentioned, we started with a Model G back in 2017 and shipping those to our first four commercial partners. Here we develop the core architectures, technology, and building blocks that would enable our industry leading performance. The lessons learned in deploying those first systems from the Model G were invaluable. That core technology innovation that we put into this then laid the building blocks and the architectures for our second generation system, the Hydra. We were able to improve our receiver technology and our laser technology and move forward to our third generation systems in the iris that we're deploying today. What's common in all of these systems is the groundbreaking and revolutionary single laser, single receiver architecture. That allowed an economy of scale, cost performance, and system robustness that was unheard of in the industry. So all of this technology enabled what we're shipping to customers today. Let's head to the receiver lab to take a closer look at one of the key components that enables our groundbreaking performance. We're here in the receiver lab where we take the chips from our Colorado Springs location and we put the receiver together with the photo detector and build our receive module. Fundamental to Luminar is the fact that we don't have to sacrifice performance with off the shelf components. We customize each of our subsystems from the chip level up. We custom design the lasers, we custom design the receivers, the scan mechanisms, and the processing electronics, and bring them together to offer the highest level of performance. As you may know, we operate at a completely different wavelength of light, 15, 15 nanometers. We do that in order to unlock the highest level of performance. The fundamental technology innovations that enabled us to go to this wavelength was developed right here in this lab. Traditional thinking was that these in-gas arrays were expensive and cost tens of thousands of dollars. We used some fundamental core technology of in-gas, indium gallium arsenide, a very rare material that typically is very, very expensive. And people ruled out the 1550 wavelength because of that. We're able to take a very small piece of in-gas, a small fleck, smaller than a grain of sand, and we combine that with our silicon receiver chip. We get the best of both worlds. We unlock the performance required to enable our LiDAR systems and the economies of scale where we have a chip that only costs around $3. With all these technology innovations, you have to patent the heck out of this. We have over 87 patents already in our extensive portfolio. In fact, it's twice as large as our top five competitors combined. That's it from Orlando. Let's hand this off to Aaron in Detroit. Welcome to Luminar Detroit. My name is Aaron Jefferson, VP of Product, and I bring to Luminar over 20 years of automotive experience, delivering safety electronics, advanced driver assist systems, product leadership, and business growth. Speaking of growth, we're growing here in Detroit, the North American epicenter for the automotive industry. I joined Luminar because I was excited about the vision and about the technology. We operate in the automotive industry that requires continuous development of performance and innovation and to a market that is looking for technological advancements. And we at Luminar bring that. There's a lot that goes from taking a product that is R&D and delivering that into serial production with the automotive grade quality and reliability demanded by the market. 
And if you look at this market and you look at all the key requirements needed to deliver the technology into the market, there are a lot of, say, sensors that have certain trade-offs and systems that have trade-offs. Uh, and maybe they can do one thing well and not the other thing, or maybe a few things independently. But we are the ones that can bring that technology all together and enable all the requirements needed to deliver highway autonomy and proactive safety. With this achievement, we now play a key role in bringing this pivotal technology to the market and making transportation safer. We do this in two ways. One, by delivering on highway autonomy, and two, by delivering on proactive safety. The nice thing about those two is the requirements for each are similar enough that we can focus in on a key technology and deliver that key technology, which enables our customers to unlock the capability and deliver into both. First, let's take a look at highway autonomy. And we believe that initial autonomy application is on the highway and provides the most consumer value for the foreseeable future. Now, you might ask yourself, why haven't people delivered this before? Many have tried. And there's a reason they haven't, because the all-around technology hasn't been available to unlock and deliver that capability. However, with our technology, you can unlock the full capability of a highway autonomy system. The reason that the sensing today hasn't met the need is because you need the range, you need the resolution, and you need the perception performance to be able to really understand the scene and the environment and behave appropriately and safely in that environment. It's the reason we've won these landmark arrangements on the passenger vehicle side, it's also the reason why we are involved in nearly every major autonomous trucking activity and development activity on the market, delivering long haul automated trucking on the highway. We foresee that the passenger vehicle market is still the market driver in the industry. And we expect highway automated functions to grow at a CAGR of 40% from now until 2030. The automotive industry is also trending in this way in terms of highway autonomy, focusing on hands off and eyes off operation. Now let's move over to safety and our focus, proactive safety. Recent data suggests that there's still 1 million lives lost annually due to automotive accidents. Today's ADAS systems really aren't designed to eliminate accidents. They're really designed to mitigate or lessen the severity of accidents. For proactive safety, our focus is to eliminate accidents. Our LiDAR is capable of unlocking and enabling the full capability of safety at higher speeds and weather and low light and can have the perception capability to detect cyclists, pedestrians, vehicles, children, and the most complicated environmental conditions. Many companies have developed LiDAR, but none of these companies have developed LiDAR to address the real market needs for LiDAR in the industry. And none have delivered upon the software required, and our software is fundamental to our system. I'll now pass it off to Christoph at Palo Alto. Take it from here. Welcome to Palo Alto. My name is Christoph Schroeder, and I'm VP of Software at Lumina. Prior to joining Lumina, I led the software development team at Mercedes that developed urban autonomy, as well as brought radar sensors into production at Bosch. Here in Palo Alto, we have 100 team members. Most of them are software engineers and work on our perception stack. Beyond Palo Alto, our software engineering team is located in Orlando, as well as Munich in Germany. Lumina's strategy was from the very beginning to build a hardware and software solution that combines both. The team, the software team here in Palo Alto has been founded four years ago with the first software developers and has done a lot of research and development work um, at the beginning. Software is extremely important to us as a company. With software, we're able to add additional functionalities and additional value to our product. We have the industry leading LiDAR sensor with the best performance. Here in Palo Alto, we work on adding the next level of capabilities and value to it. To us, a full stack software solution contains many different components. It starts with the enabling highway LiDAR technology that actually sees things. It contains things like the compute unit to process things as well as the entire software stack. You need to understand deeply and exactly how the sensor works, operates, how, for example, our scan pattern can be set to leverage that capability to build something on top of it that is much, much better than what you would be able to do if you just use the point cloud as it is. That's why our team internally is able to leverage those capabilities and build a perception stack that is much, much better, much, much more robust, and much, much stronger than anyone else could actually do. When enabling autonomy, the key thing that you need to think about is to solve for the corner cases, the edge case, the thing that doesn't happen unless it happens once in your life. You don't have anyone who supervises the car. 
what does it mean for the car? It means for the car, you cannot rely for, on, on anyone to be there in case something goes wrong. In order to solve for all of those use cases, you need a technology that gives you the range, the resolution, and the robustness to all the different environmental conditions to actually do the task in all cases. Camera technologies work well in a lot of cases, and they work really well for some ADAS use cases. But there are a lot of situations in which you as a human being can't even see something. So how should a camera see it? It's just not possible. The key foundation is gonna be the LiDAR. We are focused on solving two key tasks. We want to enable proactive safety as well as highway autonomy. In order to enable those use cases, range and resolution are key. Detecting small objects really, really far out is a key task. It's something that only can be done when you have range and resolution at the same time. You need to have the resolution to detect all those objects and distinguish them from each other, classify them, and give the decision-making software as much information as possible to actually make the decision. What we focus on right now is taking all of the technology that we developed and put it into CS production vehicles. Good example for that is actually someone like Volvo who will take our LiDAR sensor, our perception technology, deploy it in their cars and actually put it on the road by 2022 in order to enable functions like proactive safety as well as highway autonomy. Hi, I'm Scott Ferris. I'm the Chief Business Officer at Luminar Technologies. I've got over three decades of experience in scaling optical component technology companies in both public and private companies. We're currently in our advanced manufacturing facility where we do both the manufacturing of our Hydra platform as well as the pilot level work for our new Iris platform. Since the beginning, Luminar is focused on working with companies that believe in the future of mobility and autonomous mobility as much as Luminar does. We focused on four companies initially with our first generation technology. Those four companies form the foundation for some of our deepest relationships that we continue to have today. Working with companies like Volvo and Toyota Research Institute, we we're able to take that foundational first generation product and really build the capability for the next set of customers. We really wanted to remain focused on working with the world's largest automotive manufacturers that were committed to seeing this through to volume production. There's a significant difference between development programs and automotive grade series production programs. Automotive series production programs really are the holy grail of the industry. Luminar has continued to invest in the industrialization of our product. This has allowed us to grow from our initial core four customers to over 50 customers on a global basis. Those 50 customers represent the vast majority of global OEMs. Additionally, those 50 customers can be broken into three key segments, including passenger vehicles, commercial trucking, as well as robo-taxis. Collectively, that group represents over 75% of a total available market. Today, many of our OEM partners have mature highway autonomy programs with expected launch dates between 2022 and 2025. With Volvo's productions expected to start in 2022, Luminar is extremely well positioned to leverage both the capital investments we've made in our infrastructure, as well as the industrialization of the LiDAR sensor itself to help our other OEM partners scale their autonomy programs on a global basis. Luminar is also working in the commercial trucking space. We currently are working with a significant majority of the global OEM autonomous trucking application partners. Luminar's technology and the ability to see at high resolution and extremely long range is particularly important for commercial trucking because the ability to see small objects as well as fast objects such as motorcycles weaving through traffic, is important to be able to assure an autonomous vehicle and particularly autonomous truck can operate safely at highway speeds. Short range LiDAR solutions offered by the vast majority of LiDAR manufacturers, quite frankly, aren't adequate to be able to operate in this type of environment. Once these commercial trucking applications are in production, it's gonna make a significant difference. Autonomy is a true economic enabler for the logistics market. In addition, the benefits of proactive safety that we're able to realize in the passenger vehicle market also equally applies to the commercial trucking market. The other segment that Luminar has been focused on is the robo-taxi market. However, one of the limitations of the robo-taxi market, because of the sensors that they've historically used, has really limited them to low-speed environments. Luminar's technology and the ability to operate vehicles in high-speed complex environments is really the key to unlocking these robo-taxi market opportunities. At the end of the day, the biggest cost sensitivities and performance demands really are being driven by the passenger market as well as the commercial trucking market. Okay, so we've talked about the markets we're focused on, but now let's talk about where this is all really headed. 
we have 10 of our commercial partners that are deploying Hydra in an advanced development application. These advanced development programs give us a significant competitive advantage, positioning us to ultimately convert them into series production awards. By 2025, we expect the passenger vehicle market to contribute the vast majority of Luminar's revenues, with commercial trucking adding additional percentages over time. Taking a step back and looking at the true impact of the Luminar production program wins, we expect that over one million vehicles will be using the IRIS sensor technology and really leveraging the foundational work that we did with the Hydra platform. Hi, welcome back to Luminar Orlando. I'm Jason Wojak. I'm responsible for sensor development here at Luminar. We're now in one of our production test facilities. This is where our engineering teams are working on early sample builds of our next generation sensor IRIS. I'm really excited to finally share more about this news that we announced this morning. This is our first IRIS and it's going to be shipped to our partner Volvo this week. Now we're going to take a look at what it's taken to kind of reach this milestone and take you through the process. What's unique about Luminar and our LiDAR solution is that we have a single product to meet entirely what the industry needs. In order to do this, we had to deliver breakthrough performance in the point cloud and its quality but we're also going to meet the cost that the industry needs to scale. We leverage the same core technology in our previous generations, but we've refined it for size, cost, and power, and also to meet automotive qualified series production design. Iris has a unique design. To get the best performance out of the sensor, we want it to stay at the top of the vehicle. So that gives us the best point of view to get the best performance. Because of the, the, the slim form factor, we were able to work with Volvo over the past year and their designers to create a very unique slim line integration into the roof line. This is kind of a seminal moment for the car industry and its design. As we open up autonomy, it's going to act as an iconic design for the future and what initially established LiDAR and the integration of it. So, when somebody looks at the car now, they're gonna recognize that this is a car that has autonomy built into it. We've reached a significant milestone. We're at what is called the B sample phase for our IRIS product. What this means is that we've gotten into engineering validation testing and we're ready to deliver to Volvo. It's a significant milestone because it proves out all of our technology that we had in our other generations and shows that it's still capable in a smaller, cost-effective, highly mass producible product. In order to, to get to this stage, we had to develop our in-house capability. This didn't really exist in the industry before, so we hired the key talent to, in order to make this happen. So we have an advanced manufacturing team that has developed the processes in-house in a way such that we can transfer it to contract manufacturers and collaborated with them on exactly what the process would be so that we can scale this up. We're proving that process out now. We're developing the blueprint for that. We're gonna take that blueprint as we move from B sample into C sample and eventually transfer that over to a contract manufacturer. So as we transition through our B series production and into our C series, that's where we're gonna develop our production tooling. We're gonna to start to lay down the blueprint with our contract manufacturers where they're gonna to start to replicate lines. We're gonna move from thousands of units to tens of thousands of units and then easily to hundreds of thousands of units with our contract manufacturing partners around the world. That's it from Orlando today and I'll hand it back to Tom in Palo Alto. Hi, I'm Tom Fenimore. I'm the Chief Financial Officer here at Luminar. I've been a finance leader in the automotive industry for the last 20 years. First running the global automotive practice at Goldman Sachs and then most recently at Jefferies. We have a very exciting growth plan here at Luminar and let me walk you through it. Our rate of growth continues to accelerate. We have over 50 partners today using our technology, including seven of the top 10 automakers. We've already been awarded two series production programs. Let me demonstrate to you the earnings power potential of our business model. In 2030, we estimate that the total addressable market for our products is over $150 billion. If we capture less than 4% of that market, we can make over $5 billion of revenue and $2.5 billion of EBITDA. We are not your typical automotive supplier. We work with the engineering teams to put our cutting edge technology on their vehicles. Because of this, we have amazing visibility into what their plans are to launch programs 
with highway autonomy or proactive safety features in it. As many as 10 of them are working on such programs with a start of production in the 2023 to 2025 timeframe. We have a clear path to execute on this revenue growth driven by series production contract wins. First, we've already been awarded two series production programs. Second, we are actively working with eight of our existing customers to convert those relationships in the series production wins over the next 24 months. Only roughly half of those additional eight wins are incorporated in our financial forecast. To give you a sense of our success so far, at the end of this year, we expect the order book for our series production wins to be approximately $1 billion. And to demonstrate to you the exponential growth power of our business model, in 2025, we forecast that this order book will increase by over a factor of 10 to over $10 billion. Today, our revenue comes primarily from two sources. First, individual unit sales of our LiDAR hardware to customers, primarily for test and development purposes, as well as for their development fleets. Second, is primarily from NREs associated with the development and eventual launch for these series production contracts. Starting in 2022, as we enter commercial production, almost all our revenue will come from sales to series production programs and be categorized into three buckets. First, scenarios where we sell only the hardware sensor unit. Second, a solution incorporating our hardware plus software that enables proactive safety functionality. And then the final bucket would be our hardware plus the software solution that will enable highway autonomy. Our business model is very scalable and has very low capital intensity. This allows us to grow our margins, profitability, cash flows, and returns at a very rapid pace as our revenue growth accelerates. There are three underlying factors that drive the scalability of our business in the capital light nature. First, the same underlying hardware and software will be able to sold to other customers with minimal design, R&D, and capital changes. So as we continue to sell more and more sensors, we don't need to invest a lot more in R&D and capital. Second, as mentioned earlier, we are deploying a contract manufacturing approach. And then finally, as we grow our revenue and unit sales significantly, we're able to amortize our fixed R&D, SG&A, and other costs over a larger volume base, and we're able to get significant purchasing power from our larger economies of scale. To expand on this last point in more detail, our bill of material, or BOM, is expected to be approximately $500 per unit once we enter our first full year of commercial production. As we gain economies of scale, our goal is to lower that BOM to less than $100 per unit. This rapid decline in our BOM enables us to lower the price of our hardware to drive a rapid increase in adoption of our technology, including standardization without sacrificing our margins. This will dramatically increase the safety of the vehicles, not only save a lot of lives, but save a lot of time with the increased proactive safety in highway autonomy. Now, I'd like to turn it back over to Austin Russell, our CEO and founder, for some concluding remarks. Hey everyone, all right, well thanks again for taking the time um, and thank you to uh, leadership and uh, Tom uh, here. With that uh, as well, a bit, uh, thank you to the media team for pulling off this production, I know it was a huge lift. Um, certainly an exciting day, you know, I, now with out there with the announcement that we are uh, meeting and delivering this first Iris series production unit. Uh, if there was any doubt about what we were able to do and what we could really pull off, you know, in this time frame and uh, deliver against, this is the, the key milestone. Excited to be able to make that happen this week. Uh, with that, uh, I think it would be great to get started on the Q&A side of things. I'm actually here joined with... Uh, with Tom, as well as uh, Michael Beer, our Senior Director of Strategic Finance and IR, um, will be leading some of the Q&A. Um, this is the first time we've really done a Q&A in kind of a broader public forum here, so it'd be great to get this kicked off. Yeah, thanks, Michael. 
Many thanks, Austin. Uh, for those of you online, feel free to, to type your questions uh, into the chat box on the left-hand side, and we'll go ahead and address them as they come. Uh, why don't we go ahead and open this up? First question, uh, do you think there'll be multiple LiDAR winners in the autonomous car space, or will it be a winner-take-all type environment? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a good question. I think when it comes to the different verticals that you have to address, uh, you know, when there's passenger vehicle, tiny commercial trucks, robo-taxis, and the adjacent markets, I think particularly in the adjacent markets, you know, there's going to be a lot of LiDAR diversity, and as there already has been historically, and there's definitely huge opportunities, we'll see actually a lot of companies, I think, more and more pivoting into that domain, just given how hard it is to build something that can meet the spec needed to solve autonomous vehicles, and specifically the, the long-range sensing capabilities needed for highway autonomy. Uh, so I, I think with this, I mean, if we're able to execute to the degree that we think we can, I think this could very well be a winner-take-all for that specific market and domain. Excellent. This next one's for you, Tom. Uh, can you walk us through what the typical sales cycle is for an OEM when evaluating these sorts of technologies? Sure. The typical sales cycle for an OEM is usually two to three years in advance of them actually starting production, they will select the prior uh, suppliers for their vehicles and the parts that will go on, on them. We're a little bit unique because we're actually developing brand new technology and functionality for these vehicles. And so prior to that two to three year uh, in advance warning that you typically get to be a supplier on a vehicle, you have to go through a development program for new technologies the timing on that can, you know, vary by each of the individual customers. You know, for certain OEMs, it could take an additional two to three years. For some OEMs, it can be shorter than that. Right now, um, we're working on at least eight development programs where our technology is actually on our customer vehicles, and they're kind of developing those programs to eventually go in the series production contracts. As I mentioned earlier, you know, at least eight of those that we're working on now, we expect to convert into series production programs over the next 24 months. And in our financial forecast that we shared with investors, we have only about half of those or four incorporated into our financial model. Excellent. This one's for you, Austin. Uh, how do you compare your technology against Velodyne? <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a, good, it's a good question. I, I think really, it, it kind of as we, as we spoke to earlier, it really just comes down to the core tech of what we built out it was entirely from the ground up, making all of our own components, you know, lasers, receivers, scanning mechanisms, processing electronics that are needed to be able to see these key performance specifications and at the same time really be able to uh, see this product through into series production in an auto grade capacity, you know, at the cost that's really necessary to, to have this industry take off. And it's that. Uh, that trade-off, you know, that you can you can also try and build a really high-performance sensing system, you know, using a whole array of components, but it ends up either being way too expensive and still not performant enough, or you can try and build something that's really cost-effective, but then it won't be nearly enough performance to try to enable an autonomous-specific application. I, I think ultimately there could be other, you know, LiDAR-related systems for assisted driving-related uh, applications, you know, that uh, maybe have some diversity there, but as it relates to this, uh, we're, we are the only... LiDAR sensing system that actually meets the core OEM specs that are needed to see this through with autonomy into series production. And then, of course, uh, the software side as well. This is very unique to Luminar in terms of the deep hardware software integration that we built from the ground up. And that's what differentiates us as we kind of have taken things to the next level um, at, the, at the autonomous vehicle level beyond just uh, the LiDAR components. So, you know, going from a, a, a component company, albeit you know, high value components that are going in, but now a systems level company. Fantastic. Uh, and sticking with that topic, what are your advantages relative to say camera-based systems similar to those on Tesla? Yeah, so, so it's a good question. The, the, really the whole point of LiDAR is that it gives you that true 3D data in the environment. You know, cameras are really good at getting a, a, some decent resolution around 2D data in images, uh, but this, you don't have to guess what's out there in that three-dimensional plane. You don't have to try and extract and figure out what's there because when it comes to autonomy, you have to have very, very reliable detection. You can't miss things. Nor normally, a 99% a detection rate of something may be okay for a lot of applications. For autonomous vehicles, you, know, you can't miss one out of every 100 people, uh, which it's, it's actually not even <laughs> quite there yet uh, in, many, in many of those cases. So you, know, you have to have the ground truth understanding of the, of the environment. You have to have 10 nines worth of reliability. That's what the LiDAR gives you in three dimensions. And 
It's not just any LiDAR, by the way, too, as well. You really have to have that level of performance and data fidelity to make the most out of it. You know, that's where you have to have that camera-like resolution for the LiDAR, which we're actually able to deliver for the first time here, uh, and still be able to get that true 3D depth. Now, again, it's still complementary you know, to existing camera systems. You know, we're, we're not here uh, to try and uh, uh, compete with those, so to say, uh, but this does kind of serve as the uh, ground truth center for these vehicles that, and programs and companies that we're working with. Excellent. Uh, for this next topic, how are you thinking about defensibility? How are you thinking about your IP portfolio uh, and how do you protect the uniqueness of your technology? Yeah, it's, good. it's a good question. Um, when it comes to defensibility, I think this is actually something that is, is really solid for us. And it's a good question. A lot of people will ask, okay, well, what's preventing this type of technology from just becoming commoditized over time? Like, let's say, okay, you guys got the best stuff now. You know, how are you going to continue to build this value and, and uh, maintain this technological advantage? And I think there's a, the reason I think a lot of people ask one, particularly when it comes to the hard, for the hardware part of the equation, uh, which Luminar has historically been associated with, uh, is that a lot of hardware technologies do ultimately become commoditized over time, you know, and, and either lose margin, market share, et cetera, for, for what it may have. But part of the whole point is, is some companies actually are able to leverage that strong IP to their advantage. You take a look at the, the Mobileyes and NVIDIAs of this world. You know, there's no knockoff of those types of companies. You know, the, the, there's really high IP that goes into it and high value, ultimately enabling high margins over long periods of time. And that's where really Luminar fits in, in terms of ca categorically. So uh, we actually have a largest IP portfolio as it relates to, you know, these sensing systems out of uh, anyone in the industry. I think it's actually more than, you know, even, even the top uh, five other related uh, LiDAR uh, R&D uh, efforts or companies, you know, combined. Uh, and the reason why that is is just because of the fact that we really do have this core tech developed from the ground up. We're not using off-the-shelf commodity parts. Uh, that's what's allowed us to do this. You know, again, we build our own chips, we build our own, you know, receiver systems, you know, laser systems that go into this, uh, and you know, have also in parallel locked up the supply chain for a lot of the key and relevant systems that actually go into this. Even making key acquisitions along the way. You know, we mentioned earlier acquiring, you know, the chip design company uh, in Colorado Springs. You know, that was uh, specialized to one very specific component of the design uh, and something that we've iterated on with custom chips for multiple components now. So that's what's all led us to be in this hugely advantageous technical position. But at the end of the day, you need to see the commercial adoption too as well. This is the automotive industry and getting into series production specifically. It's one of those very high barrier to entry, but equivalently very high barrier to exit type arrangements. And that's why we saw it so important over the past couple of years to start getting designed into these uh, autonomous development fleets with that eye towards series production, working directly with these OEMs to be able to see these programs through. That's why it's important to get embedded into that, be integrated into the stack, and then it becomes more a matter of when rather than if that, that program will successfully materialize into series production and with, with, with Luminar as the key system powering it. So that's how we're highly defensible in a, in a way that's differentiated from pretty much any other company in this space. Great, and we have a few questions coming in on the commercial opportunity. Uh, so aside from Volvo, or in addition to Volvo, uh, can you walk us through the relationship that you maintain with the other 50 commercial partners? Yeah, so really the, as it relates to those, you know, I think Tom uh, mentioned that you can kind of separate it into different stages. You know, there's a validation stage, you know, that we have, uh, that we work with companies on where they, they initially get them for our, our sensing system, you know, uh, basically do a, do a host of tests, you know, validate, do the diligence, you know, we, we, we meet the specs that we say we do, you know, all, all those, of course, you know, pass with, with flying colors, you know, and uh, we, I don't think uh, we, we've ever really lost a, a LiDAR shootout, so to say, as it relates to uh, performance and safety and, uh, or, or even ultimate long-term economics. Uh, but when it comes down to the, the capabilities here and, and how this, these programs progress, uh, it generally starts into that phase. We progress it into these kind of advanced development contracts. Um, that's where we start uh, working closely with these companies, programs, fleets. Uh, we have to be selective about that. You know, we probably have realistically more opportunities than we can, um, you know, e e even successfully dedicate resources to to be able to take on and see through uh, to series production at this stage or why we have to remain focused. You know, we started actually working with t uh, 10 of these programs now um, at the advanced development stage. Um, and, you know, I, th I think eight of which are, are, are very promising towards 
uh, with an eye towards series production. And that's always been the holy grail of, of someone to be able to achieve that milestone of getting into series production. Of course, that's what we're now doing in the Volvo case. Um, it's been public that, that we're out there in, in addition uh, to uh, what one other uh, OEM uh, in, in that context. But as it relates to this, uh, there's, there's absolutely going to be a, a, a lot of stuff ahead on that front. And I think uh, as, as people progress through the phases, that's going to be important um, to being able to realize this, not just on the passenger vehicle side, but also on the commercial trucking side as well. So uh, I think uh, it makes sense to keep an eye on that. And this one's for either of you. How should we think about the $150 billion TAM in 2030? So when we look at our TAM, as Michael mentioned, we view it as about $150 billion in 2030. Um, as we mentioned earlier, for systems that deploy our proactive safety system, we view the content per vehicle at about $1,000 per vehicle for that system. When we look at systems for, that deploy our highway autonomy solution, both on the hardware and software side, we view that as about a $2,500 content per vehicle um, solution there. And so when we look at the forecasts for uh, potential L0 to L2 proactive safety opportunities in 2030, plus the highway autonomy there, um, you know, that is a key contributor to our TAM. Once you start getting into robo-taxis and commercial vehicles there, we believe um, there's a much stronger value proposition for our products on those vehicles, which could drive potentially higher pricing on the passenger vehicle side. And then the other thing here is that robo-taxis and commercial vehicles will need to deploy three to four sensors, uh, and sometimes in certain cases, five per vehicle. And so when you kind of look at all that and combine everything there, we get to about $150 billion TAM in 2030. Uh, and then as you go out to 2040, when you see a much higher penetration for those levels of uh, autonomy, as well as that's when we expect the robo-taxis next decade to become more prevalent, we are seeing our TAM increasing significantly to north of $500 billion. Okay, and then how do you foresee the LiDAR software landscape evolving uh, over time? And will software play a larger part in the ecosystem? Um, and will this be either uh, via uh, recurring software licenses or one time? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a good question. And as it relates to that, th there is a distinction here. I think the reality is, is that when it comes to the software side of the equation, you know, m most people have really tried to separate out this, this autonomous stack and different discrete components. You have a lot of the larger, you know, autonomous vehicle companies, you know, the Waymos and Cruises and everything of this world that have focused in on the robo-taxi domain. They've been developing software for that, you know, trying to, trying to work with other uh, LiDAR-related uh, uh, companies in, 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 in this domain to be able to get something off the ground and then ultimately um, shifting towards the right solution for series production when it's at that stage. Um, the thing is, though, is that, you know, when it comes to passenger vehicle applications, you know, and actually getting something into series production, uh, there really hasn't been any software that's successfully developed to be able to really realize this, see this through, as it relates to processing of the LiDAR data and systems. This is a very different type of approach, you know, when we're focused on highway autonomy specifically, as well as these proactive safety systems, than try to develop a robo-taxi. Um, we have to actually develop you know, something that can be deployed in a series production vehicle, you know, auto grade level and quality of code, and uh, a, a performance capabilities that you know, you can, your life can really depend on. So that's what makes all the difference there. And uh, there's no question that it's absolutely going to be playing a substantially increased role to accelerate adoption uh, of this throughout the industry. You know, I mean, just, just a LiDAR alone you know, is actually not super useful to the vast majority of OEMs. In fact, you can't really even see it commercialized until you have the software that can successfully enable it and even enable the applications that it needs to be able to go into. So that's why we saw it as key to developing the software side. Um, it, we're actually at a point now where, you know, even internally to the, to the team, you know, we've got a flexion point where we actually have uh, just as many software engineers as, as we do hardware engineers. And that's really what's driving the vision of this forward, it's, you know, what we said is, is a huge uh, portion of kind of use of proceeds for some high ROI opportunities to be able to accelerate the programs and also even further expand our TAM. You know, Tom mentioned the total size of content value that we can address, you know, on these vehicles. Uh, that's how we get to those numbers is because it's both a combination of hardware and software. Again, we will ultimately, and we do sell this uh, a la carte, so it's not a, you know, 
our way or the highway if people have different other components of the systems. We absolutely work with multiple automakers to be able to integrate that, but it is absolutely a critical part of the story and you will not see a successful industry without that. Okay, on the topic of data strategy, uh, will Luminar be able to harvest its proprietary data much like Tesla does across its entire fleet? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> also a great question. Um, absolutely, uh, this is definitely this is one of the things that Tesla got right. Uh, and when it, when it comes to getting, you know, hundreds of thousands of vehicles out on the road that can effectively go back, collect data for you so you can continue to improve a system, um, it makes all the difference, you know, for, for that given set of applications. Now, of course, uh, there's a significant difference with, with collecting camera data for an assisted driving application, you know, following a couple lanes on a road, and, and having the level of ground truth LIDAR data that you need for what, with the equivalent to some of these other autonomous vehicle fleets that have been out there. Um, collecting data with this. I, I think the key distinction here, though, is that, um, you know, whereas some of the largest autonomous vehicle fleets out on the road have had, you know, in the, in the hundreds of vehicles uh, out, out there going and collecting data, you know, in, in, in every areas like, you know, uh, Arizona or you know, Phoenix or, or Pittsburgh or where, wherever it may be, um, we actually have a, a kind of breakthrough opportunity by getting into series production to have hundreds, not hundreds, but hundreds of thousands of vehicles out there collecting data at the global scale necessary to see this ultimately realized uh, everywhere. And that's a really important point because, I mean, if you were to try and deploy like hundreds of thousands of vehicles on, on a test and development fleet, you know, to, to try to equip your own cars, you know, driving around, um, you know, with like $100,000 type roof rack setups, I mean, it, it, would, it would cost you tens of billions of dollars, you know, heck, you might as well just buy a car company at that point. Uh, so, you know, as a result, that's why we actually, instead of paying to put these data collection vehicles on the road, we actually get paid to be able to do that. And that's a huge and key advantage that we see ultimately leveraging on the software side uh, that kind of builds that uh, hugely defensible layer on the software beyond the hardware too as well. Now, while we've already uh, done the comparison of L Luminar versus Velodyne, uh, can you just walk us through some of the more nuanced differences between 905 nanometer and 1550? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, 1550 nanometers, uh, it's a longer wavelength of light. It's actually known as an eye safe wavelength. Um, people in the LiDAR industry have uh, actually, like it's, there's, there's nothing fundamentally new about using a 1550 nanometer wavelength of light for LiDAR. People have recognized it as, you could say, the um, superior wavelength for, for some time, if you could find a way to be able to make it work. And the real challenge with 1550 as opposed to 905, which uses uh, more commodity you know, silicon receiver components as well as existing laser supply chains, um, is that there are no readily available off-the-shelf components at 1550 to build a viable system you know, at the performance level and much less level of economics that are needed. Um, the advantage of the 1550, just to clarify though, is that you can get dramatically higher pulse energy and you know, peak powers associated with uh, this, the LiDAR side of it, uh, to be able to see the necessary long ranges and resolution uh, with only a small fraction of the number of components. You know, we, we've um, obviously been proud of what we've been able to build from using just kind of a, a single laser receiver-based architecture, you know, as opposed to huge, using a huge array of components. And that's in large part just because we've been able to be so efficient, you know, at this 1550 nanometer wavelength with a small fraction of the components. But again, we had to build out all of our own supply chain, build out all, all this from the ground up, um, you know, have this, this cost of, of in-gas that uh, Jason was mentioning earlier, you know, go from tens of thousands of dollars for a wafer to now just using a fleck of it, you know, with, for three bucks, you know, powered with our, uh, our chip uh, and uh, in, in volume. And, th and that's the kind of differentiation and distinction that's allowed us to succeed and, we're, uh, and also contributes to that whole commoditization question. You know, this is fundamentally differentiated hardware um, that took us, like, moving really fast, you know, five, six years to even develop the true first iteration of, you know, uh, you know, ultimately nearly a, c a couple hundred million dollars that we had to be able to see that through with, with some of the most highly specialized top engineers in the world in their respective fields working on this. So um, that's what we saw through, but it's here today, it works, and now obviously we get to ship it starting into series production with having our iris uh, sensing system all come together and start shipping this week.
Great, uh, and let's stick with that, that particular topic. Uh, Tom, this one's for you. Uh, around the cost of the system, one of the key inputs for, for making a decision, and certainly for the OEMs, um, aside from volume, what other factors are contributing uh, to our ability to really bring down that cost over time? Sure. Uh, you know, as Austin mentioned earlier, we have very few components, uh, particularly on the laser and receiver side in our product, particularly for the Irish unit that, we're, um, that we just shipped the first one today and will ultimately go uh, into the series production vehicles. And so when we look at our bomb or bill of material for our first full year of commercial production, we expect that to be around $500 per unit. More importantly, as we go from making 10,000 units per year, tens of thousands of units per year, to making 100,000 of units per year, and ultimately, hopefully, millions of units per year, we expect our bomb to decline from roughly $500 to approximately $100 per unit. Now, most of that is from economies of scale, uh, and a portion of that is going to come from some engineering changes that we make to our next generation after IRIS. And so it's really what's driving that is relatively few components that we have on that, and then because these are custom designed components that Austin and the team you know, effectively designed and built and incorporating into IRIS, as we start buying them in bulk, we're gonna be able to drive our costs down to those targets. Okay, this is a two-parter for you, Tom. Uh, do you think the current downtrend uh, in, in the stock market uh, associated with SPACs is associated with broad-based sentiment? And then the, the second part of this, uh, can you lay out the timeline uh, to close this merger? Sure. Let me take the second question first. So, you know, what we've said publicly is uh, we expect to close our merger with, with the Gores Group uh, in Gores Metropolis this quarter, um, so by the end of the year. I think the exact timing will be dictated uh, upon our SEC review process. But right now, what we said publicly is we expect to do it this quarter or by the end of the year. Uh, with the first, so, you know, I, I used to be a former investment banker, and so during that time, I would kind of, you know, share my opinions on the market. But now that I'm a CFO of Luminar, um, you know, I'm following a lot less and not too sure that I have any opinions here. I, you know, I know that, uh, you know, markets tend to be volatile and go up and go down. You know, at the end of the day, our company has a very bright and exciting future here. And, you know, the current gyrations in the stock market aren't going to impact that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, uh, it makes, make, makes sense. The reality is, is that all, all of this stuff, you know, everything from the day to day, for us, it, it's all totally in the noise. You know, we, we are um, literally and figuratively laser focused, you know, towards this deliverable, you know, in 2022 with Iris into series production. You know, th this is a launch partner. This sets the clock for everything that we do. And that's, uh, at least in, in series production on, on that front. And that's where, you know, we, we need, we're starting to scale there, scale it with other partners too as well, or other, other programs even within a partner. And that's what is gonna be making all the difference. So, um, you know, we're really um, a, a bet, you know, uh, on the technology, on, you know, the, the traction that we've made on what we're able to, to successfully deliver. And that's where, uh, I think we're paying the most attention to as we shift from, you know, a pure technology development company to now this global provider of autonomous systems, you know, working with some of the largest OEMs on the planet. So uh, that's what really matters to us at this stage at the end of the day. Great. In addition to uh, passenger vehicle, uh, trucking and robotaxi opportunities, what other industrial applications uh, are you also pursuing? Yeah. So. I think uh, as it relates to this, you know, we, we do have, uh, well, I should say, n number one, again, we, we, we remain extremely focused, you know, specifically on the passenger vehicle series production, and as well as the commercial trucking market. We see those as, as being able to materialize and having the vast majority of the addressable market, you know, for, for anything in the next decade. You know, we want to go after, you know, the, the, the market that has, you know, I mean, c consumer vehicles, uh, commercial trucking, it's, it's, you know, I think like three trillion a year, uh, you know, in sales. We'll go after the trillion dollar industry there. And then I think there are a number of other adjacent market opportunities that are sort of trillion dollar industries or opportunities that we can successfully address. And, and we are actually already starting to do that. You know, it, it helps, uh, you know, drive some further diversification. But, you know, we're, uh, we're all in, you know, mentality has always been go big or go home kind of from day one here. And that's what we're delivering against. The extent that we can leverage the exact same product that we are building for series production for passenger vehicles and commercial trucks, we will sell it into those other markets. We do believe there is huge value in that tech. Um, are we going to ever be the only player in that? Um, uh, probably not. Um, is, it, is there a lot of value? Uh, absolutely. Um, but that's the way that we're thinking about it. And we a host of different car partners and customers 
uh, in the overall you know aerospace defense sector, you know mapping related systems and, uh, and other things there. But um, but that's not going to be um, the maniacal focus that we have on on the other verticals. Uh, do you think LiDAR will become standardized or mandatory on cars and trucks as a safety feature at some point? And what do you envision as the insurance implications of something like that? Yeah, so, um, so I think as it relates to this, over the long term, absolutely. And, and th that's our goal. That was the whole vision around what we were talking about and what we've created with the proactive safety systems. Um, this is what we're building an application towards. I, I think, frankly, the safety side, despite ha everyone having talked about it in this overall autonomous industry, um, funnily enough, most autonomous systems are not necessarily being built with the singular goal of safety. Rather, there's, there's a certain other objective, okay, we want to be able to make ride sharing more cost effective, you know, which ultimately has a, a, a side effect, a, a byproduct of safety, uh, et cetera. Um, the reality is, is that there is massive opportunity for improving even the most basic levels of, of you know, autonomy or assisted driving, like level zero, which is you know, automatic emergency braking type systems. If we can enable dramatically safer automatic emergency braking and now automatic emergency steering systems, this is the kind of tech that can be able to make all of the difference to really be able to save those 1.3 million lives. And that's what we need to continue to drive towards. Um, that, that's what I think is going to ultimately drive, uh, as you said, from a, from a regulatory perspective, consumer demand perspective, safety perspective, standardization throughout the broader industry. I mean, don't get me wrong, the autonomy side is really cool. Uh, I, I think that's what's going to drive a lot of high content value in these vehicles and be able to serve as an upgrade option because it's the same you know, hardware that enables it you know, with different uh, software unlocked feature sets. Uh, but when it comes to this, there is that additional insurance opportunity that will help you know, subsidize uh, some of the technology or has the opportunity to over the long term. So as, as kind of the second part of that question, what, what I mean by that is that if you take a look at, at actually vehicle insurance premiums, you know, it's, it's one of the most um, you know, significant aspects of, uh, of cost of ownership uh, beyond the actual purchase of the vehicle itself. And you, know, you take a look for, for the average kind of uh, a premium vehicle, you know, it's on the order of you know, a couple thousand dollars a year in many states uh, associated with it with the insurance uh, uh, payments uh, for, for such vehicle. And you can imagine um, that in, su in such a, a low margin space, you know, as, as insurance in such a sort of cutthroat industry, having a dramatic safety improvement really actually starts to break some of those traditional models. You know, normally a, a, a huge safety improvement in automotive is like, if you have like a 5% safety improvement, like that's a really big deal, you know, but Imagine a world where instead of just 5% or, or some kind of incremental amount, you know, we can increase the safety, um, even by our, our preliminary analysis, up to 7x. And that's what can make all the difference. So if you can dramatically reduce that cost of insurance, that actually not only can benefit the consumer, but actually even serve as an additional revenue stream to both us and uh, even a respective OEM and insurance partner. So um, on, on that note, actually, uh, uh, today, uh, excited to announce as well that we're uh, kicking off a strategic uh, partnership with Swiss Re, the world's largest reinsurance partner in the in the industry, or the world's largest reinsurance company. Period, uh, and that's where we are actually going to be uh, working to develop these new types of insurance models, and you know, working with them. And, and other related partners along the way, you know, in conjunction with uh, OEMs to be able to see that through. That's how you can see subsidization of the, of the technology throughout the broader industry because of the difference it makes and what we're gonna continue to drive towards. So long-winded answer and a uh, bit of news there, but it'll be a, be a good journey ahead. Fantastic. Uh, Tom, can you talk about some of the benefits of having a, a uh, homogenous piece of hardware that you can port into multiple applications? Sure. Uh, so one of the ways that we're differentiated from your tr traditional automotive supplier, and I'll use a seat manufacturer as an example, not only does a seat manufacturer have to tool up and develop a different seat and seat design for a Chevy pickup truck versus a Ford pickup truck, that seat manufacturer actually has to develop and retool for different platforms within uh, GM, whether it's the pickup truck, the Camaro, or the Corvette. 
And so as you ramp up more sales as a seat manufacturer, your capital um, as well as your typical um, engineering or R&D designs need to go up because each incremental platform win that you get has a lot of incremental capital and other costs and other fixed costs associated with us. For us, the same underlying hardware and software that were initially selling to Volvo will be sold to our other customers, not only in the passenger vehicle space, but throughout the commercial vehicle space, the robo-taxi, and eventually the adjacent markets. So as we win more series production programs, we do not have to invest anywhere near a significant amount in CapEx or our fixed cost. And so as we grow our business, we expect significant growth in our margins. And longer term, we expect our margins to be around approximately 50%, given not only this factor that I discussed, but also the hardware and software combined nature of our business. And when you look out there at a company like Mobileye that kind of had a similar business model to us, they were able to achieve similar margins as that. Yeah, EBITDA margins, right? You know, Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, it's another one for you, Tom. Uh, what do you expect the consumer price will be for level three capability uh, in, in, say, 2025? You know, it, it's, um, it, you know, ultimately our customers are going to decide that. When we look at kind of, uh, you know, trim packages today that incorporate, um, you know, the leading edge safety systems or other leading edge technology systems, they typically range as an additional cost of anywhere between three and $8,000 to the consumer. And when you look at some of the take rates for similar products, um, you know, uh, not necessarily as ours, but for, you know, L0 to L2 functionality, enabling, you know, what certain OEMs call self-driving capabilities, um, you know, at that upper end of $8,000, you know, that take rate tends to be about around 30%. Um, once you're kind of down in the lower end of that range, around 3%, it can be, you know, high in that 80 to 90% range. Uh, and so, you know, ultimately our, our customers are going to decide where they price this. You know, we're going to encourage them to make it standard on their, all their platforms. Um, but, you know, my personal expectations would be in that three to $8,000 price range. And I shared with you kind of like the, the ranges of the take rates for that products. One of the things is in our financial projections, we tried to be conservative. And so the take rates for, for some of the option packages are, are actually less than 10%. Um, and so it is relatively conservative to that, uh, let's call it 30 to 90% take rates that we, uh, that we shared with you through some of the research that we described. On the topic of government regulation, uh, what's needed to win various approvals and, and how do you see that developing over time? Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's, it's a good question. There's actually a specific advantage, you know, being in the passenger vehicle space and domain, you know, versus some of these other related applications. Uh, so <clears throat> when, when it comes down to it, uh, on the regulatory side, it, it actually, uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, contrary to popular belief, as it relates to even in the, in the United States, you know, for most areas, there's actually no additional fundamental regulatory approvals or uh, barriers to entry that are needed to be able to overcome to see the autonomous technology deployed out on streets and roads today. The, the real challenge comes into play when you start uh, messing with the actual vehicles themselves, you know, if you're ripping out a steering wheel, or braking systems, or other types of modifications, you know, if you actually are able to be designed into production vehicles, um, you know, there, there's a lot of leeway and flexibility. Of course, ultimately, this varies, um, you know, geographically at a, at a global scale, you know, but at, at the same time, uh, this is also a, a key driver and reason why highway autonomy, you know, on production vehicles just makes a lot of sense to be able to get out there, and part of how it can be enabled in the relative near term. Um, without, you know, massive barriers from a regulatory perspective to be able to, uh, to overcome necessarily in a lot of environments. Great. Many uh, self-driving companies have acquired their own LiDAR companies uh, or developed them in-house. Uh, can you kind of speak to that over the last couple of years? Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think the thing is, is that it kind of goes back to uh, all of these, you know, larger scale autonomous vehicle companies. They started with the software, and then we're trying to figure out a way to be able to actually get the level of data quality, of 3D data quality, and the input into the software to be able to make sense out of it. Because at the end of the day, it really is garbage in, garbage out when it comes to the data perspective. And you really want to be able to have that the high quality data that, that current LiDAR systems at that time uh, were just not delivering. And that's what really from our perspective, from day one, I mean, part of the reason why I founded this company and part of the reason why I went down this route to create this value here is because we knew that the hardware side, the LiDAR side, 
was going to be one of the key bottlenecks to really enable this space to be able to happen. It's the foundation. And as, as a company, we started by building out this core technology from the ground up to be able to make all this come together and happen, and then start with the hardware and then work our way to the software as an autonomous vehicle plan company, rather than starting with the software and then trying to work our way down to the hardware. Um, that obviously doesn't preclude us as well with partnering with other companies too that do some of their own software development associated with that. But again, that's largely for the robotaxi domain rather than the production vehicle, passenger uh, vehicle, as well as um, you know, uh, partnering in the commercial trucking domain. So that's, um, I'd say that's the, kind of the main distinction there. And I will say though, is that despite all of these different internal efforts that, that launch that people have made aqua hires for, that people have made all of these other things for, Effectively, none of them have worked out. None of them have been able to deliver the spec that was actually needed, that was promised. You know, I mean, heck, at one point, I, I mean, it was freaking every single uh, major, you know, uh, ecosystem player from, you know, OEMs to tier ones to autonomous vehicle companies to, you know, uh, uh, to a significant extent, all these guys had their own internal LIDAR efforts. Um, Nearly all of those have kind of either shut down or gone into zombie status, you know, as they haven't been able to meet the performance specs using the same types of off-the-shelf components and trying to put in different configurations, but it just doesn't quite solve that problem. So that's really where we've come into play. You know, we knew that we had to do it from the ground up. We knew we had to start with that and then do the software. That was the vision to ultimately see this realized. Uh, it, it, it goes, and that's why it goes beyond the LiDAR itself and the software side. We've really thought about it the other way around kind of from the beginning. Right. Uh, with today's announcement that you've, uh, you've shipped the Iris B sample, uh, what else is going to be required between now and 2022 SOP? So <clears throat> we got, got, got a lot ahead of us, and I think there's going to be ultimately uh, multiple things to, uh, to be on the lookout for. Um, of course, when it comes to us, I, I'll, I'll, let's, let's talk us internally, and then we'll talk, uh, you know, some of the things more uh, what, in terms of what, what we'd expect more publicly externally. Uh, so internally, we have to be able to deliver against you know, the rest of the milestones associated with, the, with this program. You know, of course, we kind of hit this key inflection milestone uh, here of what, what we've announced today of delivering uh, the first sensing uh, system and unit there. Uh, we, we have a very specific you know, week by week negotiated series production delivery schedule you know, along the way with a lot of different things that come into play. Um, this is actually in, in large part, you know, even our um, our, our, our revenues, so to say, today are, are, are largely driven by uh, these series production programs, you know, and working with these guys hand in hand to uh, deliver first for, as we go uh, execute kind of the, through the final stages of development and work its way into series production. That's what that's that's driving towards, and um, of course that's that's unique to us in a, a few different capacities. But when it comes down to this, uh, you know, we we have a lot left to do. Obviously, I don't I don't want to diminish that by any means. But of course, the fundamental enabler of this, the technology, in large part, that's done, that's proven. There's no new science, no new engineering, no new anything that has to go into this to actually make it all work. Of course, we're, we're continuing to focus you know, on, on, on building and maturing um, the, the rest of the product. We actually have to go through uh, this kind of next phase of validation you know, for, for, the, for the sensor and at the vehicle level, as well as actually now, uh, internally from a process perspective, uh, we're actually going First, where we have this advanced manufacturing process, you know, we have uh, nearly 100 people that have been working um, day in, day out to be able to make this sensor really manufacturable, document that process, build the blueprint for how to be able to assemble it, how to be able to scale it, and then outsource that, outsource the commodity labor, the, the assembly part of it, out to the relevant contract manufacturing partners. And that's largely what we've been doing as of late, um, and now what we've been kicking off with some of our CM partners. Uh, so that's, that's what's ahead as well as kind of an interim step as it relates to series production ramp deliverables. It's how we maintain a high degree of flexibility when it comes to the actual series production side of it and, and how we can uh, ramp up in a, in a straightforward capacity. Again, working with, with automotive qualified plants, you know, actually specifically, um, you know, I think we've stated that uh, one of the lead uh, assembler uh, being in Mexico. Uh, so that's uh, for, for a host of different reasons, but that's, that's the, the view on that. That's us internally. Externally and uh, in terms of our partnerships and, and other work that we're doing, I think uh, in terms of what, what, what to look forward to ahead, uh, obviously uh, continued validation of, of our tech, what we've built out, you know, um, 
At least if, it, if it's as good as we say it is, you know, it's, it's worth a lot. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it's, uh, it's one thing hearing it from us is one thing, uh, you know, actually at the end of the day, you have to, you have, to have that commercial validation and traction and um, see, seeing that out there. And of course, we, we already have established initial partnerships uh, with, with a number of these major uh, uh, companies, you know, within the space as it relates to the passenger vehicle side, trucking side, but seeing those progress, I think will, will absolutely be key. Um, in addition to that, I, I think, uh, Really, the other thing to look out for is, you know, we've certainly made a big bet early on as it relates to uh, a focus on highway autonomy use cases for passenger vehicles and commercial trucking. That's why we, where we focused largely our resources in. Again, we are still relevant to the robo-taxi players. We absolutely think it will be incredible value over the long term. But um, I, I think, uh, think it will be great for everyone to see how that plays out, you know. Are we right? Are we not? I think we, we have an extreme amount of conviction on this um, that's maybe a little bit contrarian in the industry, and I'm probably one of the, um, I, 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 I like to think uh, one, of the, one of the people that are more grounded uh, in reality as it relates to the, the status of, of these different programs and uh, what it's going to take for autonomy to ultimately be realized in the larger scope of things. But I think uh, th this bet will hopefully pay off for us big time here. And that's uh, what, what we're going to enable. So I think those two things there, and then of course, um, you know, the, the ultimate economics in terms of what this is driving towards. I think uh, you know, t Tom mentioned that um, by, by the end of the year here, you know, we're expected to be able to end with uh, an, an order book of nearly one billion dollars, uh, largely driven by these series production programs that uh, we, we've uh, already uh, won here to date, and that's only going to continue to. Uh, uh, drive up exponentially as we deliver against these additional programs. Uh, in fact, when it comes to opportunities like what was mentioned earlier around standardization uh, and what that means, you know, that can actually be multiple programs all at the same time. Like a, a single standardization win there, you know, uh, of launching on all these different vehicle models and, and actually having it not just be an option, but actually standard on all these vehicles, that's the total blowout success that I think, you know, we have an opportunity to be able to see uh, in the, uh, you know, in, in, in the time ahead. So I see those, those are the things in terms of, uh, in terms of what's next and of course just continued deliverables, executions. Again, we try, we try and stay out of the noise, you know, and it's, we have that focus uh, towards realizing this. And I think as it relates to this market, you know, it really is ours to lose. So, you know, we got to keep delivering. Great. So next one's for Tom. The uh, company has been tremendously successful raising capital in the private markets. Uh, why choose a SPAC versus a traditional path to IPO? Sure. You know, look, I think that that's a very good question. Um, and, you know, we, after I joined uh, Luminar, we sat down and, uh, you know, we were approached actually by several SPACs. We ultimately chose the Gores team given their track record. Um, you know, the fact that Alex Gore was uh, uh, willing to join our board and, and, you know, write a substantial check into our advanced pipe, and given the fact that they had significant automotive and technology expertise. And so we viewed them as the right partner um, from the several SPACs that approached us. And then more importantly, we thought uh, the going public route via SPAC was the right forum for us to uh, really go out there and tell our story, especially on the heels of us winning, um, you know, the first series production uh, um, you know, program uh, from Volvo. And so I think that that really gave us, uh, that was the catalyst for us to be approached by the SPAC as well as it to be the avenue to us going public. And as a SPAC, you know, we're really able to tell our story in the right forum uh, over a more extended timeline um, and really was able to raise um, via this Series X, what we call advanced pipe, $170 million to, to, uh, to date, um, both from uh, Alec Gores and his friends and family, as well as our existing shareholders. So we were very excited about this path, um, and it was really a good opportunity for us not, to, uh, to, uh, not only to take Luminar public, but it also really repositioned, more importantly, how our customers are thinking about us. Um, and so I think before um, the Volvo announcement, as well as our announcement uh, of our transaction with Gores, there was this perception that we were an early stage company. Now, with the validation from Volvo putting us on their vehicle starting on 2022, as well as the validation from the Gores Group and going into the public markets, as well as being able to raise up to $600 million from this transaction, you know, we're really a company in our customer eyes that are gonna be here for the foreseeable future in a long time and to really, um, you know, continue the success that we've had so far. 
totally. <clears throat> you know, it's 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 funny coming from the uh, the early days. You know, with with all of this. You know, as a as a startup. You know, in in the space, and particularly one. Um, you know, at, at at our stage, before a lot of this was proven, before a lot of what uh, we were building out was uh, was a thing. You know, because it, we had to develop all these components from scratch, so it takes time for stuff to come together. Um, it's actually really hard, you know, to be able to work with these these major global automakers. In fact, you know, honestly, we're probably the last company that anyone wants to engage with at those stages in terms of what what, what uh, to, to be able to supply and power their future of, of autonomy. And it, it's funny because, you know, I mean, ultimately, we're the only ones that can deliver the spec. We're the only ones that can deliver the product. There's no, none of the co companies in the traditional supply chain, the, you know, the Bosch's of this world or other types of, you know, ecosystem players, uh, you know, were able to successfully do that. And, and that's where we really pioneered those relationships. We got in, you know, working at, directly with these, these customers and programs. And now, that we're at a stage where you know, they have to be able to depend on us for not just months or years, but decades to be able to come to support these programs and see this through. You know, it goes back to that kind of 10-year lifespan and cycle of these, these vehicle platforms. So it's, it's what makes all the difference. And uh, I think, uh, of course, allowing us to get the use the utilize this extra capital to as well to make the relevant strategic investments along the way, um, that's, that's certainly a, a unique uh, uh, resource that we can be able to deploy that was beyond the expectation of what we had needed to get to cash flow positive for our core business. So um, we're going to utilize that to the fullest extent and um, yeah, look forward to what's ahead there. Okay. Uh, on the topic of automotive specs, uh, are you seeing the industry start to coalesce around a, a particular set of specifications and, ha and or how does that differ from one OEM to the other? And then piggybacking on, on that topic, how are people thinking about the software side of the equation in addition to the hardware side of the equation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so you take a look, you know, I don't know, five years ago here, and I would say every OEM probably had their own idea of a spec that was necessary to be able to solve this problem. You know, is because it, the hard part was the companies that did the real work, that did the, did, the, did the diligence, you know, like the Volvos of this world early on, you know. Um, most of these companies kept it proprietary. It's not like they were sharing with all of their other competitor OEMs, you know, exactly what the, you know, what the specs were that were needed to be able to solve this problem. Uh, I think we did a bottoms up analysis very early on, you know, in the industry of what level of range performance, resolution performance, safety performance was needed to be able to successfully solve this. And uh, I, I think th we actually built our product around that spec to be able to solve it. That's why it's like, oh, like how does that, how does that automotive spec like exactly align with what you guys built? It's it's because we designed it that way. Uh, and at, at this stage now, pretty much every major automaker has fully aligned. You look at these different like RFQs, you know, programs, uh, you know, spec docs that, that people provide. Uh, they're plus or minus pretty much the same. You know, seeing out 250 meters for five to 10 percent reflective objects, you know, out of distance, being of high enough resolution, you know, all, along the uh, along the horizon, you know, seeing able being able to see that like you know 0 0.05 degrees by you know 0 0.1 degrees you know at least at least that you know at least a couple hundred points per square degree and uh, a bunch of other different factors that go into it um, obviously you know has to be something that's economical into, into series production can be auto grade too as well here um, but those are the things that are really I think have successfully converged you know we have we have a, a slide on that in the in the broader deck uh, but um, the important part is, again, you know, when it comes to highway autonomy and these use cases, um, you know, there's, there's no screwing around with performance. You really have to be able to see those long ranges, see those edge cases, see those small objects up thrown to the head, you know, the child up on the street ahead, uh, heck, even a short distance is much less long. So um, I think that's, that's how the different OEMs are thinking about it. And then when it comes to the software side, uh, it, it, software has become pretty much a requirement, you know, for, for most of these different programs. Now, sometimes different levels of software are necessarily fundamentally required, um, but I, I, I would say this is um, this is also kind of what puts us in a league of our own uh, because it's the lidar data by itself, raw, yeah, not particularly useful for most of these things. I mean, it's cool. Um, you you have to be able to meet the spec and be able to actually see it through into the real world. So again, you can get a lot of way, you can, you can get away with a lot of stuff when it comes to R&D, when you have a bunch of stuff in a, in, in a roof rack on test vehicles, you know, and don't actually put something into pure series production. When you put it into series production, it's a completely different game altogether. You know, this, this is the real deal. And uh, that, that's where, you know, you have to have this combined uh, hardware software solution to be able to see this through in an auto grade capacity. Great, questions for, for Tom. 
Uh, do you think the stock market understands LIDAR? Do generalist investors <laughs> understand LIDAR? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Is Velodyne's poor performance since its IPO a reflection of that? Um, and do you think investors are capable of understanding the differences between the performance of Luminar versus some of the other competitors? You know, I think it's a very good question. Um, you know, my personal opinion is that the public markets are in the early stages of understanding LIDAR and the opportunity uh, for LIDAR. Um, I think it's, the markets are kind of relatively familiar with the opportunity and the very large TAM for autonomous vehicles in general. Uh, but I think the public markets, quite frankly, uh, had very high expectations uh, on, on what kind of the opportunities would be in the near term or a few years ago. And then they kind of recalibrated that those opportunities are probably going to take a lot longer than initially um, thought of to realize. You know, robo taxis. Particularly with, the, with regards to the robo taxis. I think the fact that Volvo is going to start putting us on their vehicles starting in 2022 would be um, you know, probably a pleasant surprise to many investors to see that there is this um, you know, way to really bet on an autonomous vehicle company that has um, really a near-term uh, revenue opportunity within the next two years. And so I do think that there has, needs to be an education process uh, for the market to not only recalibrate on what the timeline can be for autonomy, but also that the deployment is going to be a little bit different and that this proactive safety as well as this highway autonomy can be viable and will be viable over the next two to three years. And then the robo-taxi, um, you know, which I think was the, everybody's initial introduction to the market, is probably going to take out to be to the next decade. Look, Velotine, um, you know, they're, they're a very good company, but at the end of the day, they're really focused on a different segment of the LiDAR market than we are. Um, we're really the only long-range LiDAR, as Austin and the rest of the team mentioned, that can meet these specifications to deploy this proactive safety system as well as this highway autonomy. And so in our interactions with our lot of, a lot of our customers to really do the conversions from those development programs to those series production programs, the, the customer is really only interacting um, you know, with us. And so I do think that um, as the market kind of gets smarter, not only on LiDAR and the autonomy opportunity, they'll kind of realize that um, you know, we're really um, you know, much different than Velodyne, focusing on a much different segment on the LiDAR segment. We both have an opportunity to be very successful companies, but we're playing in the part of the LiDAR segment that not only has the biggest TAM, but as we see it today, we're the only company that can really uh, enable that autonomy for proactive safety and highway autonomy within the next couple of years. Yeah. Absolutely, I think uh, I think that's 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 well said, and I think um, I, I absolutely look forward to continuing to go through. You know, it's part part of ultimately our, our jobs in a, in a complicated world in space uh, to be able to you know educate the broader market and industry. Obviously, uh, you know, you guys on the uh, the the webcast here are are ahead of the game. You know, and, and being able to to understand uh, some of the details around what's going on, and some good questions already here. But I, I think you know th there there are. There are two types of companies. Um, you know, there's there's ones where as you dive deeper and deeper into it and into into a technology or into a product or you know, and as you do more diligence, it maybe becomes, it loses some of that shine and maybe becomes a little bit less impressive, uh, so to say, either at the company or product level. Uh, for us, I, I I really think that you know the more you dive into it, the more time you spend, the more you really work to understand what we built and just how fundamentally differentiated it is, what, what we're able to do, and the problems that we're able to solve, it only gets more impressive. And uh, we we'll absolutely encourage you guys to be able to, to continue to dive deep, really understand the space. You know, this is uh, a highly complex problem. It's not intuitive. There's so much noise out there, you know, in the broader market, so many different claims. You know, you ask any, any company, you know, of, of any size in this space, you know, and, and uh, it, what they have and how they compare, they'll tell you have the, they have the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, obviously, we're no different in that respect, but we do actually have something to show for it and do have the only system that can meet the spec. And uh, as far as we understand, the only way from a physics perspective and supply chain perspective to be able to, to successfully do that at the, at the relevant cost for any foreseeable future. So, you know, I, I think uh, that's really what's going to continue to define this and help uh, build our story and background in, in the broader industry. But, you know, that's just as much our responsibility as anyone and why. We think uh, kicking this off, you know, with this investor day is uh, the best way to be able to uh, kind of get this roadshow off to a great start. Great. Um, what is the power draw of your system, and how does that compare to leading competitors? Uh, is the power draw significant enough to change the electrical architecture uh, of an EV? 
Um, yeah, good, good question. Uh, you know, I, I think that there's also one of, one of these things, so there's definitely a lot of misconceptions around. The, the answer is uh, it, it's less than 25 watts. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's actually only a, a, a very small fraction of a fraction of a percent, you know, of what would be on a, you know, reasonable uh, electric vehicle uh, in terms of overall um, instantaneous power consumption. Uh, when it comes to this, like just just for example, uh, compared to this this uh, you know this system is, is less than 25 watts for the, the actual lidar, uh, you know a, a, an air conditioner alone can reach a uh, hundred times that power consumption you know for a, for a vehicle. So uh, I think uh, that's just a, like a, like you know in the, in the end of the thousands of watts. So you know I, that's not that's not really a, a real issue here. Fortunately, I, I would say though. If the current robo taxi systems and setups don't evolve, I think that could be that could pose as a challenge. You know, the real problem from a power consumption standpoint, if it was going to actually make some kind of impact on these electric vehicles, would be you know a lot of these test vehicles have like supercomputers in the back of, of the trunks of these systems. Um, of course, you know what we're doing with our deployment with Volvo and other OEMs, we're actually able to get the compute efficient enough to be integrated onto you know a highly cost-effective you know GPU that's integrated into the into the vehicle. You know, um, po power consumption is still uh, uh, quite low, um, but that is one of the things that does need to happen. Um, you know, for uh, the robo taxi side to make that make that efficient, and part of that is, of course, enabled by the pure fidelity and quality of the lidar data that makes processing efficient. But um, to answer the original question, uh, not a problem at all uh, in our case, and probably in most cases for that matter for lidar. Uh, great. Uh, do you think Iris could change Tesla slash Elon's mind on lidar? <laughs> Um, yeah, you'll have to, yeah, you'll have to ask we'd welcome, Elon. We'd welcome an opportunity to meet with Elon and, and walk him through it and yeah. why we think it could be very helpful to his cars. I, you know, I, I, th I think it's, it's hard, you know, with, with some of these companies, they form opinions, you know, very early on, like even in the, in the Tesla case, you know, back in, uh, I, think, I think it was the first time they said it was, you know, never, never going to use a LiDAR is, you know, back in 2015, you know, when... Uh, you know these, these systems were you know seventy five thousand dollars and you know as a you know R and D system and could never um, couldn't even deliver a reasonable level of performance to actually be able to recognize what's going on accurately. Uh, much less, by the way, like up until uh, now, there's never actually been a performance lidar system that could even go into any production vehicle. Like it's never really been a thing. So for what it's worth. It's never historically even been an option for automakers to put this into a production vehicle until starting with this Volvo launch and is starting with Iris now uh, in, in the rest of it. So uh, I think it absolutely will change the game. Um, you know, I, I do think it's, it's kind of funny. Obviously, there's, there's, there is a misnomer of, okay, well, if camera-based systems keep improving, improving, they'll eventually get to a point, they'll close this gap uh, from where they are today to getting safer than human level capability. What most people don't realize is that gap is like, not, not, it's not like 20% off, it's not 50% off, it's like, you know, 10,000 X off, you know, from being able to, uh, to be safer than human level capability. That's why you need that ground truth LIDAR data uh, for, for what's going on. And uh, yeah, I, I think this absolutely for the first time is something that can be embedded in a production vehicle um, that's relevant to other automakers. Uh, we're still, uh, for what it's worth, heavily focused on the, um, uh, the auto make, like initially, Vol we wanted to get kind of a mid-sized OEM that was really uh, reliable and safety focused. Uh, of course, that's what Volvo built their brand around to be able to work with as a launch partner. But now we also want to continue to work with a lot of the high volume OEMs, you know, that occupy the majority of, of, this, of this industry. You know, we get uh, just as much money uh, regardless of, of what vehicle we sell it on necessarily, uh, you know, with we maybe a skew a little bit towards premium or luxury vehicles, but you know, we want to we want to go for the really high volume stuff too as well. Uh, following the uh, successful 2022 launch uh, for uh, the series production with Volvo, will uh, the winner of autonomous driving in 2030 use Luminar's technology and sort of building on top of that, embedded in your four percent penetration rate in the in the 2030 forecast? Uh, what have you sort of included in that in that assumption? Um, look, we believe that we're the only long light range LiDAR that can meet these automotive specs. As we get on more of these series production programs, that's going to give a significant advantage because those programs tend to last for five to ten years. And so once you're on those programs, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to displace you. 
And then, not, so not only is it gonna be very difficult to remove us from those programs, but we're gonna get a huge economies of scale advantage, which is gonna allow us to drive our costs lower and increase the adoption of our vehicles. Right. And so we're, we're very confident that whoever the winner is in autonomy in 2030, will be utilizing our, our LiDAR technology. Look, the TAM here is huge. Um, you know, at the end of the day, 4% is not an heroic penetration rate in that TAM. And I think an Austin and I would be very disappointed if we found ourselves in 2030 and only had 4% of the market and somebody else had that 96%. And so, you know, we think that there's a lot of upside here in our business model. I think we tried to use that slide to show you using very conservative um, assumptions for the penetration of the TAM on what our business can look like. Yeah. And, and, and again, you know, in that context with just a 4% penetration rate, that's, you know, we're talking, you know, 5 billion revenue, 2.5 billion EBITDA opportunity. I mean, it's some pretty... Pretty serious figures. So um, yeah, no, I mean, I mean, we, we're we're of course moving towards that uh, winner take all type uh, strategy or arrangement. But uh, when it comes into it, the, of course, the focus that's driving almost all of that is the passenger vehicle side, <coughs> as well as the commercial trucking side. You know, I think again, uh, if you were to reassess in uh, 2040, I think that's where the maybe the robo taxi side would would play a significant role. Um, but that's what's going to be driving all of this, and yeah, it's it's just a matter of um, of getting out there. Well, we'll I mean, we'd certainly expect 100% to be on this, uh, on on any winning. No, I wouldn't even just say any winning program, just any program that successfully materializes. You know, because you again, you need to have an uh, something that is auto grade, safe, meets the performance specs, is actually put into series production. We have just such this huge advantage of the economy of scale network effects that Tom was mentioning. Um, you know, that if you, somebody wanted to displace you, you'd have to have better tech at a lower cost and access to that supply chain, which we've already locked up, not infringing a relevant IP, and be able to have the, the software and the data, you know, which you wouldn't be able to have at that point. So, you know, I think, uh, I think we're, we're golden. It's, it's really our, what we need to do is we need to execute. That's what, that's what will determine that. You know, I think, I should say, that's what will determine how quickly we get there. You know, I, I think uh, that's gonna be the key variable. Um, but, you know, in terms of the long-term value as we realize that curve, um, that's, that's, we're all aligned on that, on that vision. Hey, can you talk about Luminar's uh, dynamic and proprietary scanning methodology uh, relative to other MEMS-based technologies or, or solid state? Yeah, yeah, uh, <clears throat> absolutely. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I think there was a lot of hype around this, this notion of a solid state type of LiDAR with zero moving parts in it, you know, so, some time ago. You know, I think it, it, it was uh, initially kicked off with you had these, you know, like I said, 50 pound spinning systems on the roof of the uh, roof of vehicles that were like, you were like, okay, we need to shift to the, uh, to the other end of the spectrum, um, you know, just have a, a something, let's elim eliminate all possibility of all moving parts in a system altogether. Uh, the problem is, is that basically it handicapped you so much that you could never have the level of performance or safety that's needed to actually solve the problem in the first place. And I think it was, there was, uh, there were some other companies that were funded with surprisingly large dollar amounts at surprising valuations early on that didn't necessarily materialize that kind of led the charge, you know, on, on that, uh, in terms of going down the solid state, the pure solid state route, um, you know, into kind of what amounted to some of these other companies that are out here today. But they're really just, um, to any extent of our knowledge and the physics behind it, which, you know, things can change, but the physics doesn't, um, you know, and we don't believe there's any viable way to build a true solid state system that meets these specs. So uh, again, it really comes down to, we had to, it's, it comes down to most of the core components that we had to build from the ground up, that's how you do it. And then we actually pair it with a very lightweight uh, mirror that scans the beam that's integrated into the system o over the field of view. And that allows us to be able to have a really dynamic uh, ra raster scan type pattern, you know, over the field of view. Um, the uh, scanning system is actually, you know, in terms of what we've done and, and for what it's worth with this uh, initial shipment with Iris, it's already qualified, it's auto grade, it already meets, you know, temp specs, uh, shock and vibration specs, everything that's, that's there, um, you know, so we're in a, in a really uh, solid place. But when it comes down to uh, the dynamic scanning pattern, that is key as part of this, because basically it allows us to focus the resolution and the image focus, the LiDAR data points where it matters most. You know, and to be able to really get to a point of where you can make out things very clearly into the distance. And that's how, you know, you saw some of the examples that are presented with, um, you know, seeing a, a stalled car way out in the distance, 250 meters ahead, seeing the girl and the ball out on the road, 
uh, with dynamic scanning and the resolution focus there, that's what makes a, a, a huge uh, difference uh, in, in being able to clearly make out those objects as well. And that's what we can do uh, with our proprietary system. Again, it all had to be designed at the system level, you know, with each of the different components. You know, they weren't designed in a vacuum, they were designed to work together. And uh, that's how we can make all of this work. So instead of scanning, instead of having a huge array of lasers in receivers, you know, we have this kind of single laser receiver pair type architecture that scans over the field of view. Great. This one's for Tom. Uh, Tom, how do you define public market readiness and how does Luminar measure up? Sure. Um, you know, look, I would say that the team has really put in a lot of work here over the last few months uh, for us to be uh, public market ready. Uh, and so as Austin mentioned before, um, we made um, a lot of hires uh, at the senior levels uh, over the past 12 months to expand the team and really bring in the right talent, not only in the technology industry, but throughout the automotive industry to help us grow. Um, you know, we recently completed our, our audits here with, with Deloitte. Um, we're rapidly uh, expanding our, our finance team as well as our other team um, around the firm uh, to enable us to be a public company uh, and allow it to be ready here. And so, um, you know, look, a lot of work has gone into this, but I'm very confident that we're ready to be a public company and very excited about the opportunity. Great. A uh, handful of questions here about uh, adjacent market opportunities, mm -hmm. other industries, uh, including robotics, warehousing, logistics, aerospace. Um, Austin, do you care to touch on, on how we're thinking about some of these other adjacent opportunities? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, so you know, I, I think, and I think it's consistent with regards to our our, our focus. But you know, I, I do still believe there are you know these billion dollar opportunities you know for lidar and related applications within that. Um, you know, again, no, I think we have we have some of the uh, uh, the largest uh, you know customers or programs that we're working with you know within uh, you know for example the d defense and aerospace sector. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, different different programs when it comes to uh, related automation and robotic systems. Um, and I, I think I think for there, there are definitely a lot of last mile kind of delivery opportunities that I think will be manifested um, over, over the course of the uh, next uh, real, real, you know, I wouldn't say immediate term, but you know, lo longer term. I think there could that, there, that uh, operate at lower speed, and I think there are some. Uh, there are, are some different markets there that are, are certainly interesting. I, I like I said, I, I think I think ultimately it's less interesting to us off the bat, you know, and that you know we're. Um, I think while you can use our stuff, you know, for like a sidewalk delivery robot, you know, uh, it, it's it's not necessarily going to be the first applications that we really see driving the value of this business over the long term, you know. Uh, that's that's not how you become a, a, a hundred billion plus company. I, again, it will be valuable. It will continue to leverage that, um, but uh, you know we we are still maniacally focused on the, on the passenger vehicle side, commercial trucking side. Uh, but you know there are uh, there do continue to be a host of applications that we continue to leverage the same product for. Um, as well, you know there are other certain types of of contracts that we may even sell subsystems for, uh, both the, the hardware side and the software side, on a continued basis. Um, that uh, to be able to generate kind of incremental uh, near-term revenue streams to be able to help drive economies of scale at the component level. Um, so, so we already do that with our chips, for example, you know, and we'll, we'll continue to do that with other components too as well for specialized applications. Okay. You know, the, yeah, the one thing I would just add there is I was, if I would say if there's any adjacent market where I think we see the, the biggest near-term opportunity, it's going to be on the defense side. And I would say for two reasons for that. One is, um, you know, as Austin mentioned earlier, um, a business we bought a few years ago that does our chip design, BFB. They kind of come from, a, you know, a legacy defense nature. Uh, and so that gives us some inroads in the defense space. The other thing about our technology in the 1550 wavelength is it's not visible to the naked eye. The lower down you go to, you know, and particularly as you go above 1,000, you have a risk that it becomes more visible to the naked eye. And so if you start or, thinking or, about- Or uh, IR cameras. Or IR cameras specifically. And so when you think about uh, potential autonomous defense applications, one of the benefits of operating at 1550 is it's not visible at night by the naked eye or kind of traditional um, IR or infrared uh, applications. Yep, absolutely. Great, why don't, we, uh, why don't we call this the last question here. Uh, um, Lumina calls itself the global leader in autonomy, uh, an automotive LiDAR technology. Uh, what makes you feel confident in being the leader versus, say, other players in the market? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so it's, it's, it's a good question. I think um, really we're, we've become a leader in, in a few different dimensions, a few different factors. You know, for first at the technology, the component level, um, 
then at the product level, then at the company level, and then at the system level. And we've consistently proved that out step by step over the past you know, eight years here along the way. Um, you know, we've delivered against these milestones. We've actually delivered everything um, uh, uh, almost all almost amazingly plus or minus in the, in the scheme of things you know on a, on a time horizon that even uh, I think is, is, is uh, we'd, li we'd like to think impressive um, in terms of what, what we've been able to do against against the goals and autonomy goals but when it comes to the actual lidar itself you know why, why are we there why can we um, call ourselves the best why do others um, and, and why do all of our partners uh, work with us here in this capacity towards uh, series production, it really just comes down to the fact that of all the different companies that started initiatives to be able to enable and try and build this key missing sensing solution that can meet the spec, we're the only company that meets the spec. And we're the only company that meets the spec at a cost in economics that can actually be put into series production in an auto grade capacity. And that's fully validated by both our partners and the fact that we actually have won the first and only you know, series production programs, actually putting this into the real world um, at, at, at scale for autonomy altogether. So I think that really validates us, again, not just on the hardware side, but also on the software side in terms of what we're doing. Um, there's nothing that's even really remotely close in, in that domain. And that wide gap uh, is something that, that we're very confident and proud of. Again, you know, as you dig more and more into it, I think it only gets more impressive, and uh, despite all of the claims and the noise out there, uh, there's the reason why we're the ones here and why we're the ones to have solved that problem. And hopefully, this whole video and uh, uh, as part of the live stream here has been able to give uh, some of that context and, and background for how we've been able to solve this and uh, why we really are that global leader. Excellent. So with just a minute here left before the top of the hour, why don't we hand it back over to you for some concluding remarks? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Um, well, appreciate all of you guys for, for joining us today. Um, you know, excited to be able to, uh, to really have you all along here for the journey. Um, you know, thanks again for this engagement. And, you know, of course, uh, we got we got some good stuff ahead. I, I actually I just um, released as well kind of a uh, overall uh, letter in terms of, you know, State of the industry, Luminar, where we see our positioning in, in that market. So, you know, feel free to, uh, to share that out and I think summarizes some of the things that we, we've actually talked about in, in more detail today. Uh, so, you know, be excited to, uh, to get out there with this. So thanks everyone for joining. Look forward to, to what's ahead.